Happy belated Thanksgiving, everyone. Uh, some of you know that I had the privilege over the past couple of weeks to take a vacation, a family vacation to Japan. And so uh, we had a lot to be thankful for. We returned um, on Thanksgiving Day. Unfortunately, five out of six of our family members got sick with either the flu or flu-like symptoms. You can see my young son was knocked out for about three days, my daughter a couple days after that. And unfortunately, while I was taking care of my daughter Violet, you know, we were sleeping in the same bed, and I got out of the bed, and I stepped, and I heard a loud crack. And as I stepped on my iPad, and so, you know, the screen was cracked incredibly badly, hundreds of dollars down the drain. So I wasn't feeling all that thankful while I was on vacation. And when you have moments like that, I wonder to myself, how can we foster gratitude not only during the Thanksgiving season, but in every season and situation of life? Because it's easy to talk about being thankful. It's easy to be thankful during Thanksgiving. But when stuff like this happens, how do you remain thankful? And I think we'll have some answers in the Bible this morning. If you have a Bible, you want to turn in it to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians is a letter written to a church in Philippi by a man named Paul. He was very religious and very angry. And those two things tend to go hand in hand when your faith is about yourself and other people needing to meet the impossible standards of what you ought to do instead of the joyful anticipation and appreciation for what Jesus has already done for us by dying on a cross for our sins to forgive us and draw us close to God. And so this very religiously trained man fiercely hated Christianity, but then he personally met Jesus and was transformed by the experience. And in fact, his joy in Jesus led him to travel across the Roman Empire to share the good news about Jesus, to raise up and equip local churches, but he ran into fierce opposition, winds up in jail for being a preacher of the gospel. And so from the bowels of prison, he writes to the believers, to the church at Philippi, to share some important truths about how to remain thankful in every season of life. Philippians chapter 4, verse 10. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So in verse 10, Paul is thankful for his Philippian brothers and sisters in Christ who have loved him and supported him while he's in prison. But He's also going to take this opportunity to teach them about having a thankful life in Christ. And so verses 11 through 12, he says, I have learned in whatever situation how to be content. Whether my circumstances go from an abundance of food and friends to being hungry and poor to being needy and alone, I am content. Well, how do you do that, Brother Paul? What's the secret? Verse 13 I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And this is the secret to contentment in any and every circumstance of life. Now, we often hear or misinterpret this verse to mean, I can achieve any personal goal or achieve any dream by my faith in Jesus. Do you know that you cannot actually do all things in Christ? That's not Jesus' promises. Paul can't manufacture a prison break, no matter how intensely he believes in Jesus. He's stuck in jail till God determines otherwise. And you can't win the Super Lotto or win the Super Bowl or get whatever job that you want just by believing hard enough. But what Paul is actually saying is, regardless of the fact that I am in prison, suffering, I can face all things with Jesus because he's my Lord, he's my Savior, he's my God. He's the one who gives contentment and strength to me to face every situation in life. And so what we see is when we read, I can do all things through him who strengthens me, 
This has very little to do with our personal strength in the face of great odds and everything to do with Jesus' strength and his goodness and our constant dependency upon him. And so the big idea is how do we intentionally practice finding contentment in Christ as described in this passage? And we're going to discover that thankfulness to Jesus is the soil in which contentment grows in any and all circumstances that you find yourself. That there's something about as we turn to Jesus with a grateful heart, acknowledging and appreciating that having Jesus is better than all things, then you will begin to experience contentment and strength based on His goodness, whatever your current situation, whether it's better or worse, whether it's in sickness or in health, whether you are richer or poorer, that you can experience contentment. Okay. But what about those times when it seems like God doesn't provide for me? How can I be thankful in my lacking or in my longing when the desires of my heart go unfulfilled? Verse 12, Paul says, In facing hunger, in facing need, prisoner Paul declares, I still experience contentment in Jesus because godly gratitude requires making more of the good that we have than the good that we don't. What I mean is, There's a lot of good things we want that we don't have. And so we have a tendency to dwell on, I want to have a satisfying career or nice stuff or the love of my life. Now, wishing is not necessarily wrong, but it tends to prevent gratitude because by definition, we can't be grateful for something that we do not have. And if wishing is all I do, then I will never be grateful. Gratitude requires moving our hearts, and our eyes from things that I don't have to the things that I do have. It means saying that there is real good in this car, in this job, in this home, in this situation, that we want to be able to learn to say, thank you, Jesus, this is good. What you have given me is enough. And I can be grateful for that, and I receive it as a gift, as a blessing from you. And that is is what Paul describes as contentment. Because gratitude celebrates the blessing that's received. As long as we're consumed with the blessing that we have not yet received, then we will never be content in Christ. Oh, I see. I get it now. So I need to lower the bar of my expectations to have a mediocre life in Jesus. Is that what you're saying, Paul? Then I'll be content? That's not what Paul means. If we read a few verses earlier in this passage, look At verse 6, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Paul says, don't be anxious, but pray with thanksgiving. Present your needs to God, but with thankfulness. Then he'll give you everything that you want, when you want, the way that you want? No. The promise is that he will give you the peace of God that transcends all of our crises and our comprehension, that protects our hearts and our minds from envy and worry because we discover in drawing close to Jesus, what I have in Jesus is better. So the practical implication here is that thankfulness to Jesus grows our contentment in what we have in Christ instead of what I don't have in life. That as we bring our needs and our desires before the Lord, we offer them to Him, we surrender to them to Him in prayer, and then with a grateful heart for the goodness of Je- that Jesus gives and, and the goodness that Jesus is in our life, we can experience peace and satisfaction for our soul. Okay, but how do you fight your way to that place of gratitude when your circumstances are miserable? There's a woman named Cornelia Corrie Ten Boom who was born in Harlem in the Netherlands. She's part of a devout Christian family. During World War II, she joined as a member of the Dutch resistance against the Nazis. She and her family harbored hundreds of Jewish people in their homes 
to protect them from the Nazi authorities. She ended up betrayed by a fellow Dutch citizen, and her entire family was arrested. And she wrote about her imprisonment in a German concentration camp, crawling with fleas. Now, her sister, Betsy, a spirit-filled woman, urged her to practice gratitude, to thank Jesus even for the fleas in the camp. And Corey thought that her sister was completely out of her mind, And yet, as she did give thanks, even for these little things like fleas that were plaguing her, she discovered that the guards were starting to give her and all the prisoners in the barracks unprecedented freedom from harassment. She would later learn that the reason they had a reprieve from all the harassment and assaults was precisely because the guards were afraid of the fleas. Now, If Corey could give thanks to God for fleas in a Nazi concentration camp, couldn't I find a way to thank God for his goodness, even in the midst of my deprivation or devastation? This holiday season, as you gather with other people, don't be afraid to name your crisis. I want to challenge you to talk about your fleas, your struggles with physical illness and mental illness, with loneliness, with unemployment, then fight your way to gratitude. Paul describes believers in 2 Corinthians 6, verse 1 as both sorrowful yet always rejoicing. And that by trusting in Jesus with the help of his Holy Spirit, that this can also be true for you and I and all of us. So I want to challenge you to take your brokenness to Jesus. Weep and then give thanks. And see if he doesn't bring the peace of God into your heart in a very personal and profound way. Now, some of you, you may not be going through a season of suffering and might think, well, it's easy for me to be thankful. I'm doing all right in life right now. But are you, though? In verse 12, if you can pull up verse 12 for us, Pedro, Paul declares that he also knows how to experience contentment in Christ in times of plenty, in times of abundance. Why does he say that? It's not just him reminding us to be grateful in God's provision, but because he knows that you can be in a season of abundance and not be content. And so he reminds us that even in times of plenty and abundance, that we need to experience contentment in Christ. Even with the economy currently humming, Americans are feeling more anxious, more depressed, more dissatisfied with life than they did right after the great market crash of 2008. A survey of 2.5 million Americans examined how do people feel in their day-to-day lives across key dimensions of well-being, including physical wellness, supportive personal and family relationships, financial security, a sense of purpose, and connection to one's community. And overall, the results show that a nation where well-being is in sharp decline from 2016 to 2017, the U.S. saw the largest year-over-year drop in well-being in the 10 years that Gallup has been tracking this data. In 21 states, registered absolute declines in levels of well-being, and not a single state showed statistically significant improvement in the year 2017. People have more and are less content. So perhaps you're not in a season of need but you're not really content in life. And here's how you can tell. You think you're content, but if that provision, what you have, was taken away from you, would you still be content in Christ? If not, then it doesn't matter if you're on team have or have not, because you're playing the same game and you have the same problem, that you're not deriving lasting satisfaction from life with Jesus. And so the antidote is that we practice thankfulness to Jesus. Practicing thankfulness to Jesus grows our contentment in Jesus instead of in what we have. You catch that? Yes, we thank God for what he provides, for the job that I enjoy, that pays the bills, that engages my skills. Yes, we thank God for your nice home and the food on the table and your good health and your meaningful friendships and that primo parking spot out front of Lucky's yesterday. But if any of those things dissipate from our lives, will my contentment dissipate with it? 
It will unless gratitude is fixed on the unchanging blesser rather than the temporary blessing. I want you to think about it this way. I try my very best to be thankful with my wife, Melissa, as often as I can. So I thank her for planning our family vacation to Japan. I'm thankful to her for cooking delicious meals. I'm thankful for her help in folding the laundry. And those are all good things to show gratitude for. But if I only give thanks for what she gives me, what she does for me, how content am I going to be in that relationship? If any of those things cease, or if any of those things go away. But when I remember to say to her, I am thankful for how sacrificial you are with the kids and with the family. I am thankful for how honest you are with me and Emily, even when it's not what we want to hear. I'm thankful for how gracious and forgiving you are with me when I mess up all the time. Then, I don't have to receive a vacation, a home-cooked meal, or folded clothes to still experience joy and contentment in the relationship because I'm appreciating who she is, not just what she does for me. Do you experience that with Jesus? I am very concerned because most of you fit into this latter category. Some of you are in the have-not side and in your deprivation are learning to give thanks during those moments. But many of you, I'm concerned, fit into this side. You have a lot, you think you're content, but you're not. Not really in the ways that last, because your satisfaction with life is located in what you get in Jesus instead of who you have in Jesus. And I suspect that many of us don't regularly feel intimate with Jesus, expressed through an ongoing appreciation of him and his relationship with us. And so I'm going to give you a moment later to take time to reflect, to give thanks before we take communion together, to acknowledge and appreciate who Jesus is to you. Maybe something like Psalms chapter 73, verse 25 through 26. Whom have I in heaven but you? There is nothing on earth I desire besides you. My heart And my flesh may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Thankfulness for who Jesus is is what's going to give us lasting contentment, whether I have or I have not. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. What makes that statement remarkable is Paul's trust in Jesus' strength not to get him out of prison, but to sustain him with joy, with peace, with strength in prison. In the face of being falsely accused and unjustly arrested, many of us would complain, I trusted you, Lord. I believed you. I followed you. I obeyed you. I served you. I shared the gospel to all kinds of people. I started churches in all kinds of places. And this is my reward? But instead, Paul declares to the Philippians, Whatever circumstances, prison or free, better or worse, sickness or health, rich or poor, job or unemployed, my joy and satisfaction is in having Jesus. Thankfulness to Jesus is the soil in which your contentment will grow. And so I want to ask you, how will you practice contentment in Christ through gratitude towards him. There was a man who established a medical mission in an area of India where progressive blindness was common. Thousands of people were born with sight would be doomed to blindness as they matured him throughout life. And so this Christian ophthalmologist, he developed a procedure to arrest this terrible disease that ravaged people. And people would leave that clinic knowing that they would see when otherwise they were doomed to a life of blindness. And what's interesting is they wouldn't say to him, thank you. Because that phrase is not actually part of their dialect. Instead, what they say is, I will tell your name. 
And I think that's what thankfulness looks like. With Jesus' name on our lips, we tell people, we tell one another, we tell ourselves, we tell God how great he is and what he's done for us. And so this Thanksgiving season, may you intentionally practice grateful heart, grateful words, a grateful life in whatever situation or season you find yourself today. God, our Father, we invite your presence in this quiet moment that as we continue to worship you, may we be men and women who practice gratitude, not because it's some religious rule we need to do, but there's something about remembering you, reminding ourselves, acknowledging how good Jesus is that brings contentment to our hearts, that brings peace in our storms, that shakes us out of our complacency. For many of us, we have so much and we're so distracted by life. We're so busy with our entertainment and with our work that we have little time for gratitude. We forget and you fall between the cracks. But instead, God, would you transform our hearts this morning? May we come to you and tell of your name, speak of your goodness. And may thankfulness be the soil in which our, your contentment in us grows.